Welcome. This afternoon, uh, Eastern Time, we're going to talk about what failures, whenever you see information on a certificate, like failures are the responsibility of the manufacturer, what does that mean? The bottom line is, when we look for failure rates on certificates, we need to know some information. We need to know how this data was gathered, and we need to know what the messages really mean. I'll explain how reliability engineers know and understand that there are many different methods for calculating a failure rate, and they're all valid for certain assumptions, and they're all acceptable depending on the objective of the analysis. Our objective in safety instrumented system design is gathering realistic failure rate data to do probabilistic analysis and verification of a safety function. My name is Bill Goebel. I've got over 40 years of experience. I spent some time in a OEM manufacturing company. That company did mechanical products and electronic products. And for some period of time, I was responsible for the group that analyzed field failures and published failure rates. In the last 20 years, I'm proud to have been part of Exida. Exeter is a global company with offices around the world providing one of three business segments. Uh, we have an enterprise tool group. We have a certification and assessment group and a life cycle services group. Engineering tools are created by the tool group and they include special tools that are meant to implement systems level uh, safety life cycle services. This group also does OEM tools meant to help those who develop new products uh, create those products that are that safely and effectively. In the last 20 years, as Exeter has grown in our certification business, I'm proud to report that the ARC advisory group found in 2015 that Exeter was the global leader in safety device communications. Even in the original logic solver category, where the whole concept of functional safety certification began in 1982. We're happy that we overcame a, a nearly 20 year head start to become the world's leader. Exeter pioneered the cybersecurity certification pro, uh, marketplace by becoming the first certification body in the world to be accredited for cybersecurity certification. We have a lot of publications, we do a lot of training. We offer a lot of both for fee and absolutely free training because we would like to help the world be safer. In IEC 61511, in all functional safety standards, there's two fundamental concepts. Protect against what are called systematic faults, and that's mostly human errors, you know, like software bugs and so forth. And bad calibration instructions, things of that nature. And the second thing that we really need to protect against is random failures. A detailed engineering process is the defense mechanism against systematic and a probabilistic performance-based system design is the defense against random failures. If you go through the whole standard, you realize that there are basically three SIF verification issues that must be addressed when confirming that a particular safety function meets a particular SIL level. 
Now, today we're going to be focused primarily on item number two, the probabilistic calculation. Now, PFD average calculations, a lot of, there are people who just do them to check the box. They don't pay any attention to the result. They don't really understand why they're even doing them. And it's such a shame because PFD average calculations probabilistic analysis can provide valuable operational predictions, including both downtime as well as safety integrity. Given this, this performance-based, uh, the fundamental performance-based criteria in the standard, there are many things that can be done to optimize either capital cost or life cycle cost or somewhere in between just a lot of economic benefits. But there are many variables that, can, that must be used or can be used to get realistic results. If you actually want to use this analysis to do economic optimization, you should be as accurate as possible and defendable when your management says you want to spend what? Anyway, Excellentia is one of the tools in the Excellentia suite deals with all the variables that Exeter has recognized after studying literally thousands and thousands of field failure reports over the last uh, 20 to 30 years. The bottom line is most practitioners agree that failure rate data for the devices used in the safety function is, however, one of the most important of those variables. So we're going to talk now about how do we get this failure rate data. And we prefer accurate prediction, and that requires a realistic failure rate data. Where do we get it? Let me give you a little definition of failure rate. Failures per unit time divided by the quantity exposed. Now, all the details and all the theoretical uh, development of this definition is available uh, in the book in the upper right corner of your screen. It's published by ISA. You can get it on ISA website, uh, Amazon, or Exeter website. The bottom line is this failure rate metric is the foundation for many of the metrics that we need to do all the economic and safety optimization that is that we can. There are two fundamental methods used to get failure rate data, prediction and estimation. Prediction is the analysis of a design and its components to predict a failure rate based on the components used, their design strength, and system operational stress. It's an old technique developed decades ago. At Exeter, we use a calibrated FMEDA technique embedded in the FMEDX tool that we use ourselves and offer to others. Estimation is the second technique, and it involves the statistical analysis of actual field failure data. And we're going to talk about this today because it is very important that whenever a certificate uses estimation, that we understand the limitations and assumptions of the statistical analysis. As an example, Here's a failure rate calculation done from a spreadsheet that we developed at Exida. First, we enter the number of failures. If it is a manufacturer's warranty return system, we estimate the number, the percentage of reported failures. Because as many plant engineers completely understand, not all failures are reported to the manufacturer. If we're trying to compare an old design to a new design, we look at the complexity factor. And when we're done, we get a point estimate of the failure rate. In this case, 1.23 e to the minus six per hour. Then we apply a confidence interval. It's a statistical metric. 0 0.7 means 70% confidence interval, which gives us an upper confidence limit 
of 1.29 e to the minus 6 per hour. That is the rough, simple concept for estimated failure rate data. And it looks pretty simple, eh? Well, the calculation is, the problem is the assumptions. We have to make an assumption about the number of failures reported because often they are edited, truncated, whatever word you want to use, they're filtered and you don't get to see them all. Sometimes we have to make an assumption about the number of operational hours. Often we have to make an assumption about the number of reported failures. And we sometimes have to make assumptions about the complexity factors of an old design versus a new design. Getting to be a lot of assumptions here. In my opinion, that's one of the reasons why uh, the editors of IEC 61511 2016 wrote some pretty strong language about the failure rate data. Read that. Must be blah, blah, credible, traceable, documented, justified. It's a pretty good list. Oh, and more importantly, and shall be based on field feedback from similar devices used in a similar operating environment. That kind of fits in with that FMEDA technique. Components, design strength, operating environment stress. Reliability engineers know and understand this. Considering the 61511 requirements, what's the definition of a failure? A realistic definition is when a device fails to perform its intended function. I mean, I, I hope this definition is quite obvious to you. Yeah, it clovers everything. And of course, realistic counts of failures should not filter out or eliminate real failures. Count them all. Now, one of the issues here is that many people look at all the data and try to classify it into two categories, random versus systematic. Hmm, which failures are caused by a human error in the procedures and in the design versus random failures? And we've done several white papers and several seminars on this exact subject. So if you're interested, get on the Exeter website and look them up. All that information is free of charge. For example, what if a maintenance mechanic randomly miscalibrates a sensor and the safety function does not trip when a dangerous condition occurs? Hmm, is this a dangerous failure? Well, you're darn right it is. Is this random or systematic? Well, we, are the calibration procedures correct? Answer, yes. Hmm, looks to me like this is a random failure. And using the above definition, this kind of a failure should absolutely be included. And uh, that, that is the exit of policy. And we kind of line up with uh, Sintef, the people that do the or read a failure rate analysis on that uh, particular topic. However, I was taught a very different definition when I worked for a manufacturer. But you must remember that our focus was to make a measurement of manufacturing quality. We had an entirely different objective. We were using a definition, something like, when, the when a device fails to perform its intended function, when used in the specified environment and within operational limits and completely and properly maintained per manufacturer's instructions and the cause is due to a manufacturing defect. Hmm, that seems pretty restrictive. But in fact, this definition serves a valid objective for a manufacturer but does not represent the objectives of IEC 61511, functional safety, 
and those who wish to use probabilistic analysis for realistic purposes. Let's take a look at some data that came from uh, the Exeter database. Look at all the failures as reported in the right-hand side. There's a lot of different categories there and a lot of different Hmm, a lot of different things going on. If we count all of the items, we have 188 failures. Now, perhaps we can exclude the first line, no fault found. On the other hand, maybe we shouldn't exclude those. That's debatable because the testing at the incoming inspection at the manufacturing site may not include all the conditions of an operating plant. In fact, it's, it does not. Generally, absolutely does not. There's no at temperature, there's no at pressure, there's no, the, the incoming testing may very well be incomplete. So we got a number somewhere between 140 and 188 failures to be counted. And we have an estimate of operating hours based on some assumptions. Okay, we can do a calculation. But let's come back to that later. Another source of failure rate data is on IEC 61508 certificates. IEC 61508 certificates should include failure rate data for the device being certified. This can be an excellent source for device failure rate data, but methods used to estimate or predict the data must be understood. On the right-hand side, there is an Exeter certificate for a trunnion mount ball valve. And you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 12 lines with different applications and different service conditions. That's on page two of the certificate. Exeter uses the calibrated FMEDA technique based on, at this point, over 400 billion hours of field failure data. And note that we have many lines of failure rates for different applications and different stress conditions, and that both safe and dangerous failure rates are given. Now, I'm, I'm very proud that we are able to do the analysis to this level of detail. Other certificates also have failure rate data. On a certificate from another certification body, the data is also presented on page two and we can look down toward the bottom of the screen and see the data presented for a trunnion design ball valve. Dangerous undetected, 210 fits. Not ridiculously low, but it kind of seems low to me. Now there's an interesting statement at the bottom of that. Origin of values. Wonder what that means. Let's take a closer look. The stated values are the results of an analysis of field feedback, good, of the last five years, okay, good. Random and systematic failures, that's good. They count, they're not excluding systematic, that's good. Uh-oh, which are the responsibility of the manufacturer were examined. I got a copy of this and said, uh, which are the responsibility of the manufacturer, you mean if they weren't judged to be the responsibility of the manufacturer, they weren't counted? What would that look like? Now, I just want you to know this method is perfectly valid and I'm impressed that the analyst has been so forthright in the disclosure of this key limitation. But the question is, for example, how would I use this data? How would you use this data? Well, let's take a look at the data set we already took a look at. Now, this is for a uh, safety PLC, a logic solver. 
a high powered SIL3 device. And we can certainly exclude no fault found. We can exclude not received. We can exclude damaged, because that's probably shipping, right? We can exclude damaged by customer in all categories. No, 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 that's not a manufacturer's responsibility. We, we can exclude those that have just been received. We can exclude damage by the customers. If we get something that's beyond economical repair, we just throw it out and assume it's not a manufacturing failure. If we've scrapped them, we assume it's not a manufacturing failure because we can't tell. If it's out of calibration, if it's integrated incorrectly, yeah, good. We wanted to get rid of all those failures that the manufacturer is not responsible for. And that's kind of the way I was taught to do it when I worked at a manufacturer. And if you count up the failures that are left, I get 62. 62 versus 188. Hmm. Failure rate calculation, it's, it's a direct linear calculation. We're going to, well, that failure rate's going to drop quite a bit. Looks like it's at least two and a half, maybe three. So the first thing I think of is, gee, in order to use this number and translate it to something that's realistic, I, I need a multiplier of 2.5, 3, or maybe even 4. Well, how do I know what multiplier to use? Well, let's take a look. The data was 210 fits for a trunnion design. If I use multipliers of 3, it's 630. If I use a multiplier of 4, it's 840. Is that reasonable? How do I know? Is there any source where I can check? Yeah, there is. SILSAFE data. It's part of the Exeter website. We have 400 billion operating hours of field failure data going into a database, which is used to generate FMEDAs. We statistically analyze the FMEDAs and look at power field failure data, power industry field failure, chem industry field failure data, and the ARETA field failure data. And putting all that on a board in a, in a big uh, in, in a big map allows us able to, to see the picture and, and create upper bounds and lower bounds. Feel free to look on the SillSafeData.com website and see these things. And you will see, if you dig in real close, that there is data for the trunnion ball valve, but that data is in three separate applications, close on trip, tight shut off, and open to trip. Hmm. I was talking about 210. No, that's below the lower bound in any application. If I multiply by three, Yeah, the, the six, the six hundred-ish number, is a mid-range value for the um, close-to-trip application. So the first thing I would do is establish, I would choose a value somewhere between mid-range 650 and upper bound of 900. If it's a clean service, um, no tight shut-off application. If it's a tight shut-off application. A value between 2,000 and 3,000 fits should be chosen because tight shutoff is tough. And of course, higher values are more conservative, so you might have to be careful. Uh, if you want to be a little more conservative, increase the value toward the upper bound. But if the mid-range value for close to trip is of 650 is chosen, the multiplier of 3 is roughly correct. So given that, and given the studies we've done, it, it, it does appear as if that might be a reasonable number to use. 
What does it mean when it says data analysis considered field failure data using both random and systematic failures if the cause was manufacturing defects? I didn't quote that exactly correctly, but what does that mean? It means they throw away all the failure rate data that isn't a manufacturing defect, and therefore, we really should not use that data without at minimum a multiplier, and we can guess at the multiplier by using soul safe data. So let's just review. Realistic failure data come, can and should be used to optimize your system design. There are economic benefits. Estimation techniques that define a failure rate based only on manufacturing defects should not be used as is for sill verification. Sillsafedata.com does provide realistic upper and lower bound data based on a gathering of data from many several three or four sources, including statistical analysis of FMEDA results. Lastly, I hope it's really clear to you by now that failure rate data for a product is not necessarily a measure of product quality when clearly different methods have been used to estimate or predict the data. Now, does anyone have any questions? Let me pull out the uh, question box and take a look. There's a question. Where do I get data for sensors? Ah, the SILSAFE data does have upper and lower bound for sensors, logic solvers, and final element components. All of that information is on the Exeter website and there's no charge. I don't even think you have to log in to get the data, although maybe we should. Any other questions? Here's one. I see a certificate that has extremely low failure rates and cycle testing is mentioned. Is that a valid technique? Um, no, cycle testing is a method where a mechanical or electromechanical part is cycled as fast as possible on the bench in a laboratory. It's got nothing to do with real world conditions and stress factors. And perhaps most importantly, any part that is not being moved every few hours will have very different failure rates than those resulting from a cycle test. Generally, cycle test data is terribly optimistic and potentially dangerous to use. Does this make my mean? Okay, let me get, get so I can read this whole thing here. Okay. Does this mean my operations, does this make my operations safe? And if not, what's the correct way to ensure my safety of operations, considering we do not know what we do not know? A oh, good question. Look, the installation of a properly designed automatic safety function should very much make your operations safer. Ah, I should have said properly designed and maintained automatic safety function. Now, that's normally only one of many things that should be done to increase safety. So you really need to look at a big picture, do the things that give you the, ma the, the maximum safety per, uh, per effort, and work on improving your safety till you achieve your tolerable risk criteria. IEC 61511 
is a very well written document. I admire the people who wrote and edited that that standard. Read it. It's got a lot of good information for you. In the absence of adequate data, do you recommend the upper bound value in a highly hazardous environment? Yes, that's exactly what needs to be done. If you have to make assumptions and you do have no idea the integrity and the quality of your equipment, use the upper bound data. That is what I do. Thank you for that question. What's the source to accurately predict in nuclear environment, which may warrant SIL-4? Um, I, I am not an expert at all in nuclear applications, and I do not know if the stress conditions are different. I do know that in balance of plant applications, which are more like stress conditions in other industrial uh, in, in, in other industries, uh, the failure rates in sill safe data are very reasonable, especially upper bound. I uh, will also tell you that the only time I've ever been through nuclear applications, they clearly use a concept of layers of protection. I believe they call it defense in depth. Maybe that's where the whole concept of layers of protection came from, but the nuclear industry does a lot of work and puts in a lot of layers of protection so that the combination of several sets of equipment does give them the equivalent of SIL-4. But I've rarely, I did not see any single safety functions that required a SIL-4 in the job that I looked at. says the question is keeping in mind NRC requirements under 10 CFR. Uh, I am not nuclear industry expert and I do not know any of the NRC requirements. I don't even know if they, I do not, I've never heard of them using C IEC 61508 or 61511. I have heard some discussion recently that they are considering it. But of course, if you're in a regulated industry, you must follow the regulations of the country where the equipment is installed. There's just, none of us can get around that. If you don't like it, you can work on changing the regulations. But you've got to follow them as long as they're in effect. All right. I want to thank everyone for a great set of questions. If you have any more, don't hesitate. Do not hesitate to send an email. I'd like to remind you that Exeter has a lot of training sessions. Uh, this is a calendar of the training sessions that are coming up in the near future. Exit also has, if you don't have a travel budget, for example, Exit also has a whole series of online, asynchronous, on-demand, self-paced training, including our most popular courses, uh, FSE 101, primarily safety system analysis, risk analysis, HAZOP, and so forth, and FSE 102, which is the course that talks about the three barriers, uh, design and design verification. And if you're going to any shows, stop by the Exeter booth. We're going to be in Germany uh, at Emerson Exchange in Nashville at the ISA Process Industry Conference in Houston and at the Rockwell Automation Fair in Chicago, Illinois. So stop by and see our team and say hello and go ahead and tell them what you think about the Exeter webinars. 
If you want more information, we're available on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you have specific questions about this webinar, please don't hesitate to send me an email at the address on the screen. I thank you very much for your time. And if you have any ideas for new webinars, do not hesitate to let us know that as well. Enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye.